I'll see you guys in a little bit. It's time for Wine Wednesday. So grab a glass and let's chat. Welcome everyone to Wine Wednesday with the Whisperer. We have some Pinot Noir tonight, which is my new favorite, thanks to Colby. And I have a very special guest, so we won't spend much time on the wine. We're going to get right to the <laughs> guest. <laughs> I know, that was a quick, quick... I don't mind. That was a quick... Thrill. Well, okay, actually, before I even introduce you, my first question is, what is your favorite wine? You know, I drink a lot of Pinot Noirs and Malbecs. Okay. Um, yeah, especially from South Australia. Is there a particular you know, brand that you prefer? You know, honestly, by the time I have a few glasses, I don't care what the brand is. <laughs> that, that, you're, you are welcome back on Wine Wednesday anytime. Okay, anyhow. Uh, for those of you who don't know, since I started ahead of myself, behind schedule as always, my guest today is none other than Graham Short. And welcome, Graham. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff, so I won't keep you waiting. I'll jump right into it. Um, tell me tell me a little bit about yourself, Graham. Uh, I, I know, but tell the audience what you do for a living and how you got there. So I am a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences, and I'm in the ichthyology department, and which makes me an ichthyologist. An ichthyologist is basically someone who studies the taxonomy and systematics of fish. Okay. And the fish I study are all the fish species in the Synathidae family, which means pipefish, pygmy pipe horses, sea dragons, and seahorses, and every oddball in between. And I've been at the academy for about, or since 2005 now. Um, I'm involved in various projects, but we can get in that later, yes. but that's just a good <laughs> intro. <laughs> that, yeah, I know my questions don't allow you much of an intro, do they? Um, so, oh, that's all right. Uh, well, tell me this. What you, you basically explained, explained what the ichthyologist does, but I'm curious, what made you decide to focus on Signathidae? Or Signathids, I'm sorry. So it did start in about 2003. Um, I started living on my boat um, in Australia mm -hmm. in 2003, 2004, and started doing a lot of scuba diving in the various harbors and bays. And when I, I saw my first weedy sea dragon, which oh. is a cousin to the seahorse, and just absolutely fell in love with them. And then I decided, well, I want to start doing some re research on these species. I didn't really know at the time who was doing what. So during the course of those investigations, I met my colleague and friend, Dr. Healy Hamilton, who was at the California Academy at the time. And she studied Hippocampus cuda throughout the Indo-Pacific. And we talked about some collaborations together and we decided to study the entire family. Because at the time, no one knew which species was related to which. Right. So we decided, well, let's collect at least all the genera that we can, and we'll collect most of the species later. So 10 years later, we found about 95% of the genera within the family. And basically, <laughs> behind the scenes, that entails huge um, field collecting trips um, in Australia, all around the South Pacific, the US, Europe, and elsewhere. Um, so it's really thanks to the weedy sea dragons I got into uh, the Signathidae family. Can you tell me what is the process for determining a new species? What do you go through to actually qualify a new species when you're out there looking at them? So there's a lot of, there's many levels um, you have to reach in order to probably describe a new species. Um, I mean, for example, 
it can come from many angles. If I were to look through a museum collection and if, he's, if I see something unusual, I'll take that specimen out, put it under a microscope, and I'll do trunk and tail counts. Let's say if it's a seahorse, I will look at the spines. So the presence or absence of spines and the position of the spines on a seahorse is very much like a human fingerprint. Each one is unique to a seahorse species. And so let's say if I see, oh, wow, the spines are different. Seahorse looks a little bit different. I need to do some further research on it to corroborate that's a new species. I would try to find one in the wild. Okay. So that entails doing a field collection trip, obtaining a specimen, and then bringing it back to the lab to do a genetic analysis on it, just to really clinch the deal. And so basically we sequence the C mitochondrial CO1 gene or just a partial fragment. And that's like a barcode for animals. Okay. And so you compare barcodes. Let's say I get the barcode sequence and I compare against other seahorse barcode sequences. And right away I can tell whether it's different or not. And so if it is, then I can say I definitely have a new species. And then the process of describing it is you have to write out in excruciating detail every single thing that makes that seahorse new. So you write a diagnosis and a description. The diagnosis is what separates that fish from the other seahorses. Then the description entails writing every single wart, nook, and cranny of that fish, you know, the spines, the placement of the spines, meristic, morphometrics, genetics, and then you submit it to an academic journal. So there's really like three or four big steps mm -hmm. and it takes a little while, but it formally uh, establishes a new species. Right. I mean, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's awesome. I, I am planning to ask you about um, a few other things that I did see that you wrote, but is uh, when you said the, the genetic part of it, is that, is that the DNA, um, What's the word I'm looking for? The DNA sampling? Yes. How does that work? Yeah, so basically you can take a little fin clip or a bit of the spine or a little bit on the right side of the body of the fish, and then you extract DNA using the uh, DNA extraction kit. Mm -hmm. And that just takes a few hours. And then once you have a clear solution of genomic DNA, then you do what's called PCR or polymerase chain reaction, and you amplify a second of the mitochondrial CO1 gene. Um, and that means you produce millions of copies of that gene, which you can run through a gel and you can visualize it as a band. Mm. You cut that band out, you bring it to someone who can sequence it, and then you compare those sequences against other seahorse sequences. And you can base, so once you have the sequence, then you can play around with it on your laptop using various software. Mm -hmm. um, so once I had that sequence from that, putative new species of seahorse, you align it with other seahorse sequences, then you can see the differences or not. That's really cool. Go yeah. Ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so, and then you, you produce what's called a phylogenetic tree, and you can see where that seahorse falls with other seahorses. So it tells you right away, well, the seahorse might be more closely related to Erectus or to Hippocampus patagonicus, um, and then you just go from there. That just adds to the body of data in your paper. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, no, you know, I made a big mistake. I thought this was Tequila Tuesday. Oh, no. It's okay. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to tell you a little secret. A little secret is that I typically mess up a lot. And as I'm, you know, doing my Wine Wednesday, you'll see me grab a Rickers cup, with which might or might not have vodka in it. But we're, we're good. We're good. Wine Wednesday is just the chill yeah. place for us to talk and to, for you to teach us and, and, and so that people can hear about these fascinating things that you're doing. When you were talking about, I, I, I followed you with the lining it up and comparing with other, you know, um, already lined up genes and all that good yeah. stuff. Um, is that 
and then you and then you also spoke about how you could then determine where they came from. I know you've done a lot of work with that. The thing is, tell me tell me kind of about the story you told me yesterday about the pipe horse. Tell me the difference and all that. And a pygmy pipe horse looked a lot like a seahorse, except the angle of the head is not as severe as that you find in a in a seahorse. Okay. In the seahorse, the head's usually angled up to ninety degrees. In a pygmy pipe horse, it's usually around 25 degrees. Um, so they look very similar. They both have a prehensile tail, brood pouch, and so forth. Um, so this pygmy pipe horse um, was collected in New Zealand mm -hmm. by me and some colleagues. And the last um, signator to be described in New Zealand was in 1911. So more than 100 years later, here we are with a new signator species being discovered in New Zealand, which is temperate, you know, you have the North Island and the South Island. So it's very much like going from uh, Central California to Seattle right. in terms of water temperature. So it's very exciting. Excuse me. So during my course of investigations of this pygmy pipe horse, I found out that not only was it a new species, but it's a new genus. And I found this out by looking at certain diagnostic morphological characters present on the fish. And it looks very similar to species of temperate pygmy pipe horses from Southern Australia. Okay. In fact, it's almost identical superficially. You look at it like, oh, it's nothing different. But when you look at it closely, you'll see some differences primarily, and this is the fun part, this pygmy pipe horse has a coronet just like a seahorse. Wow. So, it was found, it was seen before many years ago at the Poor Knights Islands, which is a remote island off the northeast coast of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And they thought it was Hippocampus jugamus, which is a really rare seahorse found in the southwest Pacific. So they looked at him like, well, that's just a seahorse. It has a coronet. But when you really scrutinize it, it's, it's not a seahorse. It's a pygmy pipe horse. That is so cool. And is this the, yeah. is this the work that you... Um presented at the um, Sing Bio? Yeah, I presented at Sing Bio. It was a five minute talk and I went over by 10 minutes. Yeah. So they're all maybe behind the scenes, stop, stop. Right, right. But you know, once you get me going on Signathus, I can't stop. Oh, but I mean, it's fascinating. It's, it, talking to you gives me such joy and hope because there's just so much we don't know. And we were talking yesterday and I, it fascinates me how much we know now versus 20 years ago and how much you're finding that I had no idea about. It's, it's, it's great. What did you think of Singbio? Did, was it pretty, what did you think? It was awesome. Mm -hmm. That's what I've heard. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect because um, it had been a while since I've been to a conference. Well, this is the first time I actually met other people who were doing, with similar interests, doing similar research. Mm -hmm. I met um, researchers who were studying breeding behavior, looking at ecological aspects of seahorses and seagrass. Um, it was just a joy to meet people who were just geeking out on fish like I yeah. been doing. <laughs> No, exactly. I was so I meant I had tickets to go this past year or this yeah this past one and I I missed it and so and when I saw that you were at the one in Tampa I was like oh man that's so I cool. know it was fun because you know, we we had a great time you know it was you know friends from all over the world we finally met in person and we went out a lot and just you know geeked out on fish talks and you know all the talks were amazing right um, but right. the best part was making new friends and connections and. It was actually thanks to Dr. Rich Smith um, from the UK, who works on pygmy seahorses, um, who led me to Hippocampus Jacopigu, because he had observed these in the wild himself at uh, Hachicho Jima Island, um, south of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so from there, it led to a collaboration to confirm that that species of pygmy seahorse was indeed a new species. So thanks to Sinbio, it led to a wonderful paper. Right, and you led me into my next question because I actually shared um, an article about your your um, finding this new species, um, and I had no idea that it was you until I found the little G short, you know, and I, I was like, oh, wow, cool. So tell me, you just told me how that came about. Obviously, it came from your connections at Singbio. Um, 
but what all did it entail? Um, how did, what was different about them in this particular case that let you say this is a different oh. species? So with respect to the background, Japanese divers have seen or observed this pygmy seahorse for decades, you know, at least for 20 years. I've been to all these obscure Japanese dive sites and I saw pictures of hippocampus dubbed pigu, or as the articles in the U.S. are saying, Japan pig. Yeah, I, well, it, it, when I asked the pronunciation, I was like, okay, so Japanese pigu, got it, all right. Yeah. Go ahead, go on. <laughs> so it's been known to divers, but for some reason it's never been formally described by uh, academia in Japan. Um, it's been collected by ichthyologists, but they just never got around to describing it. So I said to Richard, let's just do it ourselves because I have the equipment to uh, create scans of their skeletons to look at their uh, detailed interior morphology um, in depth and compare it to other pygmy seahorses I have in my collection. So we managed to find a local diver in Japan to uh, get us some specimens, uh, the ones you see in the paper. And then I did um, a DNA extraction on a little piece of tissue. I did CT scans of their skeletons and of um, other pygmy seahorses as well. And what I found blew my mind. Mm -hmm. I was looking at certain bony structures on right behind their head, um, let's say on their neck or on their uh, upper back. Mm -hmm. You were. And I found these weird wing-like uh, spines that were kind of stretched out um, laterally. Okay. And so a certain group of pygmy seahorses have these spines, but either they have one set or two set. And this one had a double set where the others mostly had one. But it also had this weird ridge-like structure on its back. You can see in the pictures like a fine red line mm -hmm. with, okay. um, on its back. And no other seahorse uh, that's currently recognized has that uh, dorsal ridge. So it's, it's going to be important for another future paper. I won't get into it now, but it's, it's really a, a key morphological feature that distinguishes it from all of the seahorses. That's awesome. And when you're, yeah. when you're talking, please understand that I'm, not, I, I'm far from your level. So just, just oh, no, no help me out really quick. I saw the little red thing sticking out of the head in the back. Is that what you're talking about when you say the... Exactly. Um, okay. And that is that yeah. the important key thing that's going to help you to change? Yeah. Okay. So in, to say it another way, you know, all... If you, when I, I looked at many skeletons of seahorses, mm -hmm. and on their backs, it's usually very flat. Just flat skeleton on the back. Okay. With Hippocampus jacopigu, you have these weird triangular bony formations that forms a structure, structural basis of that dorsal ridge. So you have three or four triangles in a row on the back, and then externally when you see it live, it's that red dorsal ridge that you see. That is so cool. And yeah, in fact, no other fish has that. It's, it's yeah. really bizarre. Now, this, this was not on the questions, so you can tell me. You can't answer it. It's fine. But I'm just curious, sitting here talking to you, um, do you think that that's a sign that they might um, be an evolved species or a more prehistoric species? You know, I'm probably saying it wrong, but do you think that's a sign of or just that we hadn't found it yet? We just haven't found it yet. Okay. It's called a derived character, meaning... It's in the group of pygmy seahorses, but it's the only species so far that has that morphological character that is unique among all pygmy seahorses. So it means it's, it sets itself apart. Mm -hmm. And we, I don't know why it has that. You know, um, some say it's sexual selection, but it could mean anything. Right. Yeah. And you'll find uh, out and tell us. I have a feeling. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Because you are the basically the um, scientific side of things, and I am more the hobbyist captive breeding side of things. And so the article that I read about the Japapigu, did I say it correctly? You said it perfectly. Woo! Okay, so the article I read actually brought up the fact that we would not see them in um, you know the hobbyist spectrum, maybe someday 
in aquariums or in scientific uh, settings, but not ever in a hobbyist setting because of the size restriction on imports and exports. And I just wondered what you feel about that, it, you know, how, whatever you want to answer. With, with respect to imports, I think the size restriction is irrelevant. People have tried at museums and aquariums to keep alive pygmy seahorses and breed them. They've gotten up to a certain point, mm -hmm. but then it failed. It's very hard to feed pygmy seahorses because they're so small. You have to feed them baby zooplankton. And it works up to a point, but then they die off because they're starving. Mm -hmm. We tried at the California Academy of Sciences, and um, we there was two expeditions to the Philippines, and they acquired um, a pair of, of hippocampus bargibanti. And I saw them myself. They were beautiful and they were tiny, but after six months, the poor things gave up. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up in my collection. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, I know, I shouldn't have said that. No, it's, it's okay, it's okay. No, because it's the truth. I mean, we have to learn somehow. There, you, I mean, you're doing great things. There's nothing, nothing wrong with what you just said. I'm with you. I'm like, yeah. darn it. But I, I agree with you actually that the, the, the size limit isn't really it. It's the type of seahorse and what they, their, their requirements, you know. Is right. Like, exactly. Cause you know how hard it is to even keep a captive bred seahorse right. alive. Right. You know, it takes a lot of effort and it's crucial that you know what you're doing. But picking me seahorses is all. Whole another ball game. Yeah, because our side is protected. Right. Um, and pygmy seahorses, um, uh, especially, are protected. And plus, they're so hard to find that they wouldn't really make a good import unless you can figure out how to breed them. And that's probably going to be a long, long time. Sure. And I and yeah. I do believe I, the article was was based on you know. Uh, scientists breeding them not hobbies yeah exactly I, just, I, yeah. Just, I know the timeline is a lot longer when you're talking about you know seeing them in homes or even in uh breeders you know facilities but i just always wonder because i mean really you know to be serious a while back they were like you'll never see seahorses you know in the hobby you know period exactly so. yeah i mean like all the larger seahorse species when you see pygmy seahorses in the wild all the males are pregnant wow yeah and i think the male we had in our uh special tank for the pygmy seahorses it was pregnant as well i think it's just a matter of keeping them alive by feeding right yeah. Most things do come down to feeding with seahorses. I mean, I I've done a lot of breeding interview or interviews with breeders also, and it's always yeah. the key point is keeping them fed the right proper nutrition. So you know, we we need y'all to figure it out. But um, okay, exactly. so how many different it, since you started working with Signathids, how many different um, species have you found new species? Have you been able to prove that they were new species? Do you have any idea off the top of your head? So right now, there are about 41 currently recognized um, seahorse species. Okay. Uh, but it turns out of those species, there are a few that need to be revised taxonomically. So they're not going to be, they're not seahorses. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, I've described one, which is Hip Hippocampus jadpigu. There's Hippocampus hema from South Korea. Um, Right now, I'm working on a project. I'll be describing three to four new species of hippocampus. Cool. Yeah, from Southeast Asia. Um, and I am just going to be I'm describing pygmy pipe horse, a uh, new species of pipefish from Sydney Harbor, Australia, one from New Caledonia. And I there's like five others. It just, wow. yeah, I'm really happy that I'm able to be able to work on these new species because um, I'm, I'm just learning so much. Of course. And really, yeah. really quickly, um, I do want to hear a little bit more about that, but um, when you mentioned that there are a couple species that aren't really correct, um, yeah. why, how did that happen? Do you have any idea? Well, it's because at the time they didn't have 
a suite of morphological characters to broadly um, detail, like to broadly say that's a seahorse or that's a pygmy pipe horse. You know, pygmy pipe horses and seahorses are so similar, but there are certain defining features that really separate the two groups. And at the time, they didn't really have the full suite of characters to define either one. So if they found a pygmy pipe horse, they would say, well, I think that's a seahorse because I don't know much about pygmy pipe horses. I'll just put it in the mold of a seahorse. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's a totally easy and understandable mistake. Not mistake, but just, you know, it's, it's easily confused. Right. I mean, we, have, we, we, we correct things and get better with more research and new things. I mean, it's exactly. how science adding again. Exactly. There's a lot of taxonomic confusion in the literature. You know, it's all subjective. One researcher will say, well, this is this seahorse. Another researcher will say it's a different seahorse based on their knowledge and experience. So that's why Lori and Al did that global revision of hippocampus, the article I sent you, in order to set the record straight of what's really going on. And because the, the, the reason there is taxonomic confusion is because seahorses are so highly morphologically conserved. They look very similar. Hippocampus erectus looks very similar to Hippocampus wadii in Australia. I mean, they're clearly different species, but they look very similar. So, yeah. So they did a good job of mopping things up, but there's still tons of work to finish. And so I've decided to look at each species eventually each species and clarify their taxonomy meaning what's what really is that species you're finding on the west coast of australia or east coast of the u.s just out of curiosity because i know personally that lucy found a seahorse literally in florida that could or could not be a new species so my question is if someone finds a seahorse that no one you know that even scientific people are saying wait a minute, that doesn't look like any of the others. Do they contact you? Are you the guy? Or how do they go about, you know, helping with that? Yes, well, I'm one of the guys. Um, I definitely appreciated that Lucy contacted me. Um, it's just a matter of Googling who is an expert on seahorse morphology. Okay. Um, there are a lot of ichthyologists in the U.S. and around the world. Um, but, you know, ichthyologists study a number of groups of fish. Um, I mean, there's certainly other archaeologists besides me who study seahorses. Um, there's some in Australia, uh, some in the U.S., British Columbia, Canada. But I was really happy that Lucy contacted me because I'd just been working on seahorses, and um, it would be amazing if it's a new species. It's okay. It's Wine Wednesday. You can say, I'm the best. So, yes, I'm the man. You contact me. No. No, I'm just kidding. I'm such an expert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's obvious. I love it. Well, I will let you guys know once I get the genetic results back from, uh, you know, from what she's found. And I, you know, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a new species we found on the east coast of Florida. Because I, as I said, who is looking and scouring uh, Florida for a new species? Right. Um, now, if someone like, say me, I know you've helped me on the side anyways. I really, really, really love the document that you sent. Thank you so much. Mm. I'm going to try to do you proud with it. But um, what I was okay. going to ask is if, if someone wanted to know like how to tell which species a seahorse is you know, a part of or if they, in fact, are a pipe horse or whatnot, wh is there any good place online to find that information or... Unfortunately, it, the information online is scattered. It's not centralized. Mm -hmm. But there are certain websites that are indeed useful. Um, Fishersofaustralia.com.au okay. um, is a huge resource. Um, DavidHarasti.com of Australia. But it really depends where the seahorse came from. Right. So let's say, like, for example, at the museum, we receive a lot of illegally collected seahorses or those people who try to sneak them in. Oh, okay. You know, 
for pharmaceutical purposes. So we receive bags upon bags of dried seahorses. And so it's up to us to ID them. And the quickest way is just to do genetic analyses on them. Um, otherwise, I would be my hundreds <laughs> looking at all these fish under a microscope. And it would tell us right away which species it is, and then it would give us an idea where they came from, and then go from there. But a good place is the distribution of seahorses. Let's say uh, it came from Mexico. Well, which side of Mexico? The Caribbean side or the Pacific side? And there are not, there are not that many species on you know, North America. Mm -hmm. you, have, I, you have to acquire a specimen. That's the only way to truly ID a sure. uh, uh, seahorse, yeah. Which is your favorite species out of all that you've dealt with? Oh my gosh. I mean, there's too many. Um, really, it's going to be the new species of pygmy pipe horse in New Zealand. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, it has a very reddish white color pattern to it. It's found. So I found it with a group of colleagues from Auckland Museum on a vertical wall, completely exposed to the open ocean. It was very, um, you know, lots of current. We were swept back and forth. We had to hold on to kelp. And then we had to scan the wall to look for these fish. And they almost look like nudibranchs. Wow. Um, yeah, it was just trippy. And uh, underwater photographs really bring out the colors and its morphology. It's absolutely gorgeous. I just fell in love with it. But I have to say, with seahorses, I do love Hippocampus zostere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the because kind of guy that likes those little guys. And that's a dwarf seahorse, not a pygmy seahorse. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. Your work is proving that so many things that we thought we knew about seahorses was wrong. I mean, they don't need low flow. You found them on a wall out in the open ocean in extreme conditions. Your work is helping us realize exactly how seahorses really live and how we can keep them. Yeah, alive. correct. You bring up a good point is you assume there's going to be in a seagrass bed in calm water in some estuary. That's not the case at all. You'll find seahorses um, living happily among a group of a bunch of rocks to vertical walls, completely exposed to the open ocean, clinging to buoys. You know, they're found any, everywhere. Yeah, that's the cool thing about them. Who inspired your projects? My friend and colleague, Dr. Healy Hamilton. She really introduced me to the world of seahorses. Um, and she really pushed me in directions I never thought I'd get into, you know, it's just genetics, morphology. Um, so it was really thanks to her that my career in seahorses began. Uh, then there's also my uh, good friend and colleague, David Harasti in Sydney, Australia. He's an expert in uh, the species Hippocampus wadii, which is very, geographically restricted to New South Wales and now uh, to Southern Queensland. But he introduced me to the world of seahorses too in Australia. And it's thanks to him that he expanded my knowledge, you know, to a degree that, you know, I didn't realize was possible. So really two key people. That's awesome. And yeah. to them, thank you. So do you have any tanks of your own at home? No, I don't. I used to. And I used to have a lot of cichlid tanks. So I love Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika cichlids. However, um, I live half a year on my boat in New Zealand now. So I live on a giant fish tank. Okay, so as someone who spends so much time in the ocean and actually is finding new seahorse species, does it bother you that most online information, like them needing low flow, is outdated? and? focuses on conservation, saying they're going extinct. What's your take on that? I think that information is half correct. Um, certainly seagrass habitats have been deteriorating due to development, climate change, and so forth. But then again, you know, like, for example, in, um, in southern Queensland, Australia, the seagrass beds have been expanding and contracting 
depending on the weather and other variables. So for five years, you'll have sparse seagrass beds, but then for the next five years, you'll have vast, healthy seagrass beds. You know, they do recolonize. But then you, you have other signathids, um, pygmy pipe horses, pygmy seahorses, large seahorse species that you find that are not in seagrass beds, you know, among the rocks, vertical walls, and so forth, you know, places you don't expect. Um, there are certain villages in the Philippines that have been using dynamite to kill seahorses and other fish for sale, you know, fishermen, bycatch, and so forth. And that's awful. That's a horrible practice. Sure. However, those same people are being re-educated as to the value of not dynamite, coral reefs, scraping seagrass beds, and so forth. It's, it's better to have scuba diving tourists to enjoy the seahorses. So it's, it's, you know, it's two steps forward, one step back. I agree. So there is definitely hope. For sure. So when will we get to hear about the huge new information? Yeah, I, something huge. Uh, but that will be for next year because I have three papers to write. So one is the pygmy pipe horse from New Zealand. One is uh, the new species of pipefish from Australia. And then another is clarifying the taxonomic status of hippocampus wadii in Eastern Australia. There's a very similar species in southern Queensland that was thought to be different based on the taller coronet. But genetically, it turns out they're identical. So now I'm uh, synonymizing or merging those two species together into hippocampus wadii. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of papers this year, but then next year I have really two special papers I can't wait to talk about once they're published. It's going to... I. I think seahorse people are going to hate me and love me. I don't know which. <laughs> We're going to love you either way. The fact is, us seahorse people, we like truth. So no matter what you learned, we want to hear about it. At least I want to know the truth. Awesome. Thank you so much, Graham, for coming to Wine Wednesday. It's been a true pleasure, and we hope you come back. I will. Now, it's people like you that disseminates this wonderful information, keeps the excitement going, and the Nathan world, and I'm really happy to have been on here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone watching. We'll be back next week with another guest.